What is the meaning of life? Why are we alive? Most of us answer the question by saying, who knows? Who can know? We're all in the same boat. All we know is what we see in this world. None of us have ever been off this world to see differently. Even those of us who go up into space don't really get that far from this world. And we never get far enough to find out where this world came from. So it's very difficult to tell what the purpose of this life is because none of us have ever been other than in this life. That is, none of us except for one remarkable human being who lived 1900 years ago. And that's the man we're beginning to talk about in this program in connection with the overall subject, what is the meaning of life or why are we alive? And what we've said, you remember, is that in order to find a sensible answer to that question, we really have to find somebody who has come from outer space. Someone who has been outside this world. Someone who has left this world and come back to it. And uh, that person is not Muhammad. He died like all the rest of us. It's not Buddha. He was an ordinary human being like the rest of us and hardly even believed in a personal deity in the sense that we're talking about. Uh, Confucius was an ordinary philosopher. Zoroaster was. Most of the great religious leaders are in the same boat as you and me. They have no more knowledge or information of outer space or of life beyond than we have. But this amazing human being who lived 1900 years ago has. And we have been talking about the historicity of his life. That is, we have been discussing how sure we can be that he actually lived. We have been talking about the reliability of the historical records that we have had for years collected and hidden away in a book that many of us have begun to regard just as a religious book. It is, of course, the Bible. And the last quarter of that book contains the historical records of his life. And those uh, historical records, written by men like Matthew and John and men like James and Peter and others like Mark and Luke, those historical records are based on solid manuscript evidence that has accumulated since about the year 100 AD. We have actually over 4,000 different Greek manuscripts so that we can be absolutely sure that what we have of his life history is actually reliable and true. Because, of course, if you have a lot of ancient manuscripts, then you can compare them with one another so that if there is a mistake in one, it can be corroborated by five or six or ten, or in the case of the, this New Testament, 4,000 others. So it gives you a much greater opportunity to get at exactly what was written by the original eyewitnesses at the time of this man's life. That's one of the reasons we're so sure that what we have of this man's life is actually true and reliable. It's a bit like, you remember, we mentioned John F. Kennedy's death in Dallas, Texas. And uh, someone today might write an imaginary account of that death, telling how, say, LBJ, Lyndon Johnson, actually shot him in the back from the car behind. And, of course... Uh, that idea has only to be floated in the media for thousands of us who were either in Dallas at that time or who watched it on television to say that wasn't so. That's not the way it happened at all. And so, of course, the same situation was true of this man Jesus' life. The accounts that were written about his life were circulating at the time when many people who were eyewitnesses of his crucifixion were still alive. All they had to do was contradict the records if they wanted to. In fact, they didn't. In fact, they reinforced the record that you and I read today in the New Testament. So don't forget, when you read the New Testament, you're not just reading a religious book. You're not reading an old collection of myths. You're reading actual historical evidence that is more reliable than the Gallic Wars that were written by Julius Caesar or the Republic that was written by Plato. There is more manuscript evidence behind those books in the New Testament than there is behind Plato or Tacitus or Caesar or Livy or Pliny or Thucydides or Lucretius or Euripides or Aristotle. 
So when we read that historical record, we can be sure that it is some of the best history that we have of that time. But what about this man? We say that he's different from every other man. In what way is he different? Why do we believe that he is not an ordinary human being like the rest of us? Well, first of all, because he talked like God's son. That's it. He talked like the son of the supreme being behind the universe. Even though his earthly father was an ordinary carpenter, he said to his parents once, when he was just about 12 years of age, and they found him in the temple, and you might remember this story from days at Sunday school. Uh, they uh, asked him uh, what he was doing there when they eventually found him. And he replied, did you not know I would be about my father's business? Now, in fact, uh, his mother knew that her husband had no business in the temple. Uh, 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 his mother, Mary, knew that Joseph, her husband, was a carpenter. So that wasn't his business. But in a very natural way, Jesus was identifying himself with God. He said, did you not know I would be about my father's business? And he implied that his father was the one whom they were worshipping in the temple, that he was actually God. On another occasion, he said, and I think it's recorded probably in the book known as the Gospel of John, and it's in chapter 14 and verse 7, if you want to look it up. He said, if you knew me, you would know my father also. In other words, he talked like the son of God. He talked as if he was the son of God. He talked as if he was the son of the supreme being behind the universe. He said the kind of things that you and I would expect the son of God to say. I mean, it's very natural the way it flows from his lips. If you knew me, you would know my father also. He talks just as if his father is God. On another occasion, and I think it's recorded in the same gospel, it's called Gospel of John, and it's chapter 14, and it's verse 9, if you want to look at it. And he said, he who has seen me has seen the Father also. That just tripped off his tongue. He who has seen me has seen the Father also. If you've seen me, you've seen my Father. And he implied that his Father was God. In fact, it's interesting where prophets like Muhammad avoid claiming a unique relationship with God or a unique kinship with him. And it's interesting they do, you know. All those great religious leaders, they avoid claiming a unique kinship with God. Where they avoid it, this man made it the focal point of his teaching. He did. He would confront his followers with the question, who do men say that I am? And then he would say to them, who do you say that I am? So he didn't simply avoid the issue. He made it the focal point of his teaching. Now, probably many of us can think of people who have really claimed and made all kinds of wild claims as long as they will benefit from them. Because they've thought, oh, well, if I make myself somebody big, then I'll get lots of people who will respect me and lots of people who will give me money. But this man was pointed and blunt about it, even when he was on trial for his life, about this very question of his identity. So he didn't just confess it. He didn't just claim to be God's son when he would gain from it. He actually claimed to be God's son when that was the very issue that was going to cause his death. In other words, when he was on actual trial for his life, when he was being tried for his life, and the presiding official asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? He replied, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. A lot of people wonder, you know, oh, now, did he ever say he was God's son? Of course he did. Of course he did. That's in Mark, Gospel of Mark, it's called, in chapter 14 and verse 61 and 62. That's exactly what he said. He was asked when he was about to be condemned to death, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And even though he knew that would bring about his death, he replied, I am. And you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Is this man the son of the supreme being behind the universe? He certainly talked as if he was. 
He talked as if he was. But of course, many people in the psych wards do that. So let's talk about that tomorrow. Maybe he was a lunatic. Let's discuss that tomorrow.